The reading is John chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are of this sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. Well, amen. Um, it's good to be with you today. We have got a very special treat for you this morning as we think about the role of the pastor. Hearing from John chapter 10, Jesus being the good shepherd and asking the question, well, what does that mean for us as a community and particularly for those of us who particularly feel like we were formed in that image itself? We're going to do the talk a little bit differently. I'm not even standing up and I'm not going to do most of it because I'm joined by Mrs. Kay Greaves, everybody. <laughs> Very excited to have Kay here and Kay is going to be helping us think through some of the role of what it means to be a pastor. So morning, Kay. Morning, Gareth. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good. Looking good in your mustard colour. Lizzie would approve. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't want to clash with the cushion. No, so, you, you chose know. well. Good. You chose very well. <laughs> well, listen, before um, I ask you some questions about the role of a pastor, so the idea is of doing this as a bit of an interview, I just wanted to make a couple of points to set the scene for us. First thing to say is, if you've already done a test online like Simon was mentioning, and you've come out as something different to what you were expecting to, I've had a couple of people already get in touch with me going, Gareth, I thought I was going to be this, but I've ended up being that, then what I'd like to say is don't worry. A lot of the time, when we're going through particular seasons of our lives, uh, we end up leaning into perhaps one aspect more than what we might naturally as expect for us to be. So, for example, four years ago when we were planting the church here, uh, I came out very high on the role of apostle. Not particularly surprising because we were planting a new church. Everything that we were doing was new. Now, I knew that I was more likely to come out longer term as a teacher like Abby. Um, that's how I feel like God is forming. But I also know that I've got strengths within the apostolic and the prophetic as well. Those are my areas where I feel like I can move kind of naturally. And when it comes to uh, the roles of being an evangelist, that's definitely a bit clunky. And for a pastor, I wouldn't say I'm naturally a pastor, but I've definitely learned uh, how to be pastoral. And so I seek to use those tools and those giftings. So if you've come out slightly differently to what you were expecting, don't freak out. It may just be that that is the season that you're in right now. Uh, so as, as with most prophetic words, when they're given to us, we need to receive it and say, well, is that giving me a sense of peace in line with what God is saying to me, what other people have said to me as well? Uh, and if it's not, that's OK. It's just a test. It's not defining your life. What we do is process this stuff in community. It's why doing it in our connect groups is so important. And again, if you're not in a connect group, encourage you to get involved in one of those. stphillips.org.uk slash connect groups. And thank God for the tech team who helped restore the website after I crashed it, Kay, Oops. on Friday. Yes, <laughs> in one fell swoop, I made the whole thing die. So we're very grateful for the tech team. Okay, so that's the first thing. Don't freak out if the test gives you something you weren't expecting. Second thing to say is that Jesus encapsulates all five of these ministries in the perfect way. Jesus is the perfect apostle. He's the perfect prophet, the perfect evangelist, the perfect pastor, as we heard in our reading today. 
That's why we wanted that reading, to remember that Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the one who lays his life down for his sheep. Now, Jesus taught us that to follow him, to, to walk along that, that narrow path that we were speaking about before Christmas, to become radical disciples of Jesus means for us to take up our cross, deny ourselves and follow him. So in each of the ministries that we might play, there's always something of dying to ourselves that we might serve others. These gifts that Jesus has given is for the building up of the church, not just so that you can feel better about the gift that you've been given, but so that we can serve one another in love. The goal of these gifts that Jesus has given, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd, the teacher, is so that we can bless one another and the world who doesn't yet know Jesus. Now, all that to say, some church traditions use the word pastor to talk about the leader of the church. And so before we get into talking about what it means to be a pastor, what it means to be a shepherd, we're not using that definition here. The role of a pastor is a gift of being a shepherd. And that's what we're going to ask Kay to help us dig into. It's a gift from Jesus that he gives to the church, not a role that someone plays within a church. And finally, as I've kind of hinted at before, if you don't come out as a shepherd on our little uh, test that we're doing online, then it doesn't mean that you don't have to be pastoral, that you can leave it to other people to do the caring because that's not really what I do. The whole point of us looking through these five ministries over these five weeks is, well, it's twofold. One is a prayer of impartation. That those who are speaking, those who are teaching, as we pray, just because we're not gathered in a building, does not mean that the Holy Spirit cannot impart something of himself to that. There's a story in the Old Testament where Moses has called out some elders because like running the community has become too much for him. Uh, the Lord says, I'm going to give you some people to do it alongside you. So he calls out 72 elders. 70 of them join him at the tabernacle. Two of them stay in the camp. We don't know why, but they hang out there instead of meeting with Moses. The Holy Spirit falls in power on all of these people on the 70 who were there in the tabernacle and on the two who didn't bother coming. The Lord is not confined by physical distance. The Holy Spirit can impart something to you as you're watching online, even if you're not watching live. So firstly, we wanted for those teaching to be able to impart something as we teach and then pray into these gifts. And the second thing is for those of you who are naturally gifted in these particular areas, then to move in those areas. We want to encourage you so that you help catalyze those things even more in our church. We want the evangelists to catalyze us all to share the good news of Jesus. We want the pastors to catalyze what it means to shepherd others, to love on others. And so, Kay, talking about the questionnaire, you had a really interesting response when you started filling in the questionnaire, didn't you? Tell us a bit about that. Okay, well, um, I've done a number of these questionnaires, Gareth. Yeah. I've, I've been around a while and, I, and I've done it a few times. And every single time I came out as a pastor. Okay, so strong pastor, no question. Strong pastor. And so I was like, yay, great. That's what God's called me to be. But I'll be honest, inside, I was disappointed. Disappointed? I was genuinely disappointed. There was, there was something in me that felt, and this is a personal thing, but I felt it was, it was the lesser call. You know, I wanted wow. to be an evangelist, you know, saving people into the kingdom or an apostle starting new exciting things, which aren't me at all, but they just sounded, <laughs> they just sounded a lot more interesting. And, and so I struggled with it to begin with. Mm. Um, you know, I just wanted to be something different, but I've learned over the years. And, and you know what? I love Jesus's new commandment in mm -hmm. John 13, just the simplicity of this. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And apparently, I googled it, but apparently <laughs> the commandment to love one another appears 13 different times wow. in 12 different verses in the New Testament. Wow. So I think this is something close to God's heart, that yeah. he just, he wants us to be people that love. 
and it's as simple as that. Essentially, that's what being a shepherd is. And my story, actually, is that I was shepherded into the kingdom. Okay. So for me, it wasn't a prophetic word. It wasn't an evangelistic event or, or even great teaching. But at 17 years old, I was a very, very broken person. Mm. And somehow, I managed to find myself, having not come from a, a Christian background, in a, a small group, a, a connect group type situation. Mm -hmm. And for a year, those people loved me cared for me, nurtured me, until in the end, I said, yeah, this is, this is what I want. These people have changed my life, and I want to come into the kingdom of God. So I, now I can't deny the value and the importance of the calling of shepherds in the world. Isn't that amazing? So you were shepherded in? Yeah. Just through community and through yeah. being loved into the kingdom? Yeah. So I, th I think there's something important there, though, Gareth, and that's you know, as shepherds, if you've just done your questionnaire and you've come out as a shepherd, don't despise or devalue that calling on come your on. life. You know, if God has called you to be that person, then be released into that calling. Oh, and al man. also, I hope I'm okay to say this, but church, don't devalue your shepherds. Mm. Recognize them, esteem them, value them. It's such an important word, I think, because certainly one of the churches I was a part of in my 20s, um, everyone wanted to be an apostle. Yeah. Everyone wanted to start. So, yeah. so that whole idea of doing something exciting and being a pastor was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, the, that's for kind of the weak people. Yeah, let's or, just be nice. Or the people who have to go a bit slower because yeah. they're a bit broken. But actually, there's something really important yeah. about us all stepping into our gifting. Yeah. Come Absolutely. on, shepherds, we need you. So, all right, how, Kay, you said you were shepherded into the kingdom. Love that. How would someone know if they are a shepherd other than doing the questionnaire, right? Okay. So they've done the questionnaire, but how would you resonate with, okay, this is what it means to be a shepherd? Well, well sometimes it's really obvious. Sometimes people just know that that's who they are, and that's great. Right. But I do think sometimes it's, it's less obvious. Um, I know loads of pastors, shepherds, and they're all very different. Some mm. are introverts, some are extroverts, some are really loud, some are really quiet and gentle, some are really out there, all different. And, and I think it's important to know that, you know, there isn't a one size fits all if God's calling you to be a shepherd. It right. can be anybody. Um, but I think some indicators mm -hmm. of, of being a shepherd. Um, first of all, if you're somebody that has strong empathy for mm. people. And if I might, just for a moment, a little Brené Brown wisdom oh, here. Oh, Brené. A little Brené on, on empathy. Empathy is not sympathy. Mm. So sympathy is when you look at somebody in struggle and you say, oh man, I, I feel so sorry for you. That's t what a terrible situation. How awful. Mm. And you might also intimate through that. I'm so glad that I'm over here and you're over there. Right. Sympathy creates distance. Mm. Empathy is when you draw close to somebody. So good. When you draw close to them in their struggle and you say, do you know what? I hear you. I see you. And no, I might not have ever been in the same situation that you're in. But I know what it means to hurt. I know what it means to be lonely or whatever it might be. Mm. And empathy brings connection. And some, I think people that are natural shepherds have something of that in them naturally. That when somebody hurts, they hurt. Yeah. And they connect with people through that. So which reminds me of the Greek word for compassion, which means to suffer alongside. Yeah, great. Love that. Love that. So I think em empathy is a good indicator. Yeah. Another one is if you're one of those types of people who sees people on the fringes mm -hmm. and you just want to draw them in, you want people to belong. You know, you come to church and there's loads of stuff going on, but you spot the one person that, that sat on the edge. Right. I think that's a good indicator that you've got something of the shepherd calling in you. Another one I think is a heart for justice. Mm. That you want everybody to be treated fairly. Mm. Um, I love Micah 6 8, you know, to l act justly, mm -hmm. love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So good. And, and finally, on this bit, I, I think one key gifting is a shepherd tends to just naturally do family mm -hmm. really well. 
um, not now, obviously, but typically welcome people into their homes. So come on, come and belong. Yep. Hospitality. And this isn't just for people in big families. You can mm. be a single person and have a real heart for hospitality, really want to draw people and be family for people. And, and I think that's really, really important. Uh, can I share a, a quick story? Go on. So when I was, I'd moved up to Manchester in my early 20s, and I knew nobody up here, nobody. Mm. And I joined this fabulous church. It was a great church. It was an evening service, and everybody had gone home. And I just couldn't bear to go home to my one-bed flat. <laughs> I was just, I wasn't in a good place. Mm. I was lonely and low. So rather than going home, I was just wandering around the streets around the church. And after a while, a car drew alongside, and a couple that I recognized from church um, just said, do you want to come back and have a brew? And I went back, and we just had a coffee and a chat and a biscuit, I think. And it just, Gareth, it changed everything. Mm. I went from feeling utterly low to just feeling hopeful and just feeling really different. And what was interesting was they said to me that they drove past, they saw me, and they just drove past. Mm -hmm. And then they had that little prompting of the Holy Spirit that said, no, you need to drive around the block. You need to go and speak to her. And I never went back to the house ever again. It wasn't wow. like this massive friendship that started. But in that moment, they were family to me. In that moment, they just made all the difference in the world. Do you know, I feel really challenged just because um, yesterday I was <clears throat> walking and felt that kind of Holy Spirit nudge. And like we do, we, we, I, I just discounted it. I was like, oh, we all it, do can't, it. it can't be Jesus. Yeah. And I've, I've got this to do. Honestly, I sound like one of the guys in the story, the Good Samaritan. But isn't it fascinating yeah. to be challenged by that idea of responding to that prompting of the Spirit? Because yeah. you just don't know what the Holy Spirit is going to do through Yeah, it. so important. I love that. And that desire to to connect and to be with someone. Clearly, you are more pastoral than me, <laughs> and I need to learn how to respond to the no, Holy no, no. Spirit more. Do you know, we're all learning, aren't we? Yeah. We're all learning. And I miss so many opportunities, so many opportunities. Um, but yeah. Yeah, well, so um, if someone then feels like, okay, I think I probably resonate with that idea of being a shepherd, um, what are some of the challenges? What are some of the pitfalls? Uh, empathy is a great thing, mm -hmm. but... I mean, particularly in the season that we're in right now, mm -hmm. everyone's going through it anyway. So yeah. you're asking us to suffer alongside. I'm suffering enough on my own. Thanks, Cave. Yeah. People might be saying. So what are some of the pitfalls and how might we avoid them yeah. uh, when we're thinking about the pastor or the yeah. shepherding? Well, let's be honest. This, this gifting, this call to being a pastor or a shepherd, it's about relationship. And as soon as you get into a relationship, there's going to be pitfalls. Yeah. It's, it's just the way it is when we're working with people. I think the first thing that I'd say that's really important is that just because you have the gifting of a shepherd, it doesn't mean that you're a counsellor, a mm. psychologist, or a social worker. Great. You know, those guys, they train for many years for very good reason. Yeah. And it's really important, I think, to know your boundaries. And mostly, when you walk with people, it's just, it's just a huge privilege. My experience, it's just a blessing. You know, you walk with people, you get blessed, you make good friends, you see people grow, and it's amazing. But the reality is that when you walk with broken people, sometimes you're going to come across people that will need professional help. Right. And I think it's important to say that your job as a shepherd is to signpost them to that professional help mm. and not try and be that. Right. If you start walking with somebody and you sense that you're just out of your comfort zone, that you're out of your depth, I really would say that as soon as you start to feel that, ask for some help. Great. Know that that isn't the place for you to go. I think another big pitfall for, for people who've got a big heart mm. is that you have to know that you can't help everybody. You've just said right now, there are so many people that are struggling. Yeah. You know, on your street, there will be so many people who are struggling. In your church, in your connect group, there's a lot of people. And it's easy to feel guilty. It's easy to feel overwhelmed. Mm. And you have to remember that there, you're not the only shepherd. <laughs> there right. are other people. So ask God, who's, who's God put on your heart? And you walk with those people. 
and that trust that God is going to put other people in the mix to help all of those other people. You can't do everything. One at a time. It's good. One at a time. Um, and then I think finally uh, around pitfalls is these, these people are not ultimately your responsibility. Mm-hmm. They're God's responsibility. And it's important to remember that, that we have our part to play. We walk alongside people. We support them. We love them. But ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit who brings healing and restoration, not us. So it's God's responsibility, not ours. And maybe a helpful image for that is if you're walking alongside with someone, you're you're suffering alongside with them. Uh, Maybe they've got a broken leg. You can't fix their leg, but you can allow them to put their arm around you and you can walk them to the hospital or something like that. and, And you can support them as they're there. Uh, I think that's a really helpful mm. analogy to, to remember that we're not responsible for it, but we can walk alongside yeah. with people yeah. as they're going through what they're I love that. going through. I love that. So um, how then, Kay, we've thought about the, this is what I might, uh, how it might resonate if I am a, a shepherd. These are some of the pitfalls. What about flourishing? How do you do it well? What are some of the things that you've learned over the years about how to be a shepherd in a really positive way? helpful way okay this might sound a bit counterintuitive but if you want to care for other people well you've got to care for yourself first Mm. um it's so important that you love yourself the kindest thing that you can do for other people is to love yourself to look after yourself you know if we look to jesus who is the greatest shepherd he knew that he couldn't be ministering to people all the time and reaching out to people all the time. He took time out. You know, he went to be with his father. He knew that he couldn't run on empty. So he would go and he would spend time with his heavenly father. He would be filled again with the love of God. And then he would go back and minister. Mm. But he knew how important that was. Another li- a little story, if that's okay. okay um, go for it. I used to be in um, a, a lovely... Um, group a, a listening prayer group with mm. a bunch of five or six lovely friends and we'd meet on a friday and we'd chat and we'd have coffee and it was just a really lovely place to be and then we'd read scripture and we would wait on god and we'd just listen and it was just the most wonderful thing sounds amazing yeah it was great <laughs> but there was this one friday when one or two of us both admitted that actually we we felt that it was just really quite self-indulgent. We Mm. felt guilty about going and spending time, you know, just being lavished on by God and being filled with the goodness of God. Mm. And we, we talked it through and we all agreed the same thing, which is that actually the kindest thing we can do for our husbands, for our kids, for our work colleagues, for our church, is that we do take time out. Because it's so easy to get burnt out, to be ministering out of nothing, Mm. And then that's a really, really dangerous place to be. You know, there's an accuser who will come and make you feel guilty. Right. And I think if you are feeling guilty, that doesn't come from the Lord. Mm. That comes from the accuser who's trying to distract you. Jesus, I, I loved that prayer that, that we heard earlier. I mean, that was mm, just great. beautiful, wasn't it? But, you know, Jesus will lead us beside still waters and restore our soul. And it's, it's so important that we take that time out to do that. Mm. Um, I think another point about flourishing, um, Proverbs 2, it says, For the Lord gives wisdom. Nice. And if we're going to be in any ministry, it doesn't matter, does it, whether a teacher, pastor, apostle, what it is, we need God's wisdom. Yeah. He needs to be the one that's leading us and guiding us. And as soon as we start doing it in our own strength, then we're not going to be as good as if we're doing it in God's wisdom. Mm. So regularly, we should just be asking God for wisdom. Okay, God, where do you want me to be ministering? Okay, God, in this particular situation that I'm in, how can I best minister? What do people need to hear? Um, And then finally, um, on flourishing, um, our goal is that people become dependent upon God and not us. Come on. So when we walk with people all the time, we need to remember we're not there to fix them Mm -hmm. because we'll be there an awful long time if we try to do that. 
our journey with people as, as pastors and as shepherds is to help them to become more mature in Christ. Yeah. This whole series is about discipleship, isn't it? Yeah. So this is about us helping people and you know, drawing them constantly, drawing them to the word of God, drawing them into prayer, drawing them into that place where they eventually can become stronger and stand on their own two feet and then learn to flourish in their ministry and in their gifting. Brilliant. So if someone's like going, oh, okay, everything you're saying is just like, yeah, that's me. I, I want to flourish in that. And I mean, I'm resonating with it because I, I, I love everything you're, you're describing and totally recognize that what Jesus came is to seek and save the lost. It's our ministry, whatever it is, is yes to one another, but it's to those who don't yet know Jesus. It's got to be about loving people into yeah. the kingdom. Um, so how would someone flourish here? Um, within our church community, what, what what might there be some next steps for someone who's like, okay, I think I'm a shepherd. What what would I do? Okay, uh, this won't surprise you, Gareth. Okay, that, that I'm going to talk about connect groups now. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, the first thing to know is is where is God calling you to minister? Yeah. And and I I ge- not just because we're connect group leaders, okay, but I genuinely would say to everybody. Get yourself into a connect group Mm. because that is a place not only where you can have your your own heart attended to, but that is the place where you can serve and minister to others. You know, our our connect group is amazing, but Chris and I don't do that ourselves. It Mm. is the group that is amazing. It Mm. is the group that when somebody puts a prayer request on WhatsApp, they respond to each other. And it's, it's beautiful to see those, all those beautiful shepherds in the group reaching out. Yeah, let me pray for you. Let me support you. And even those people that, you know, they might be a, a three or four, even a five on the, on the scale, on the questionnaire. Yeah. But still, in that community, in that space that God's put them, they can reach out and yeah. minister. Um, and it might as well be in a connect group. You know, where else has God put you? You know, your street, your neighborhood, mm-hmm. your workplace, your youth group, you know, where, wherever it is. But ask God, where is it, first of all, that you want me to use these shepherding gifts that, that God has given to me? Yeah. The second thing, really important, I think we touched on it earlier, but it's really important that you've got accountability partner or mm-hmm. a support structure of some kind. Yeah. Because you can find that there are times when you just need to chat things through with somebody. You know, Chris and I really appreciate that as Connect Group leaders, you and Lizzie have always said that your door is open, that we know that if we needed to, we haven't, but if we needed to, yeah. we could come and knock on your door and talk things through with you. Yeah. And I would say that for everybody, connect group leader, whoever it is, just know who it is that you can just chat to, that safe person, that safe place, right. if you need to chat things through. Mm. Um, and then again, we, we definitely touched on this earlier, but listen to those promptings of the Holy Spirit. Mm. You know, and, and the more you do it, the more times you do it and you respond and you realize actually it was God, yeah. <laughs> the more confident you will be to continue doing it. And, you know, sometimes you get it wrong and they go, actually, I'm fine. You haven't lost anything, have exactly. you? So I would really say be, be really attentive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And if somebody pops into your mind, if you are recalling somebody thinking about somebody, mm. just bob them a text, mm. send them a card, give them a call, whatever it might be. But don't ignore those promptings. Um, and then just finally, um, going back to where we started, uh, going back to John 13 mm-hmm. and the Great Commission, it's simple. Just as I have loved you, also you should love one another. Yeah. And I really do think it's that simple that every single one of us, whether we're a really strong call to be a shepherd or whether there's just a little tiny call of us, but all of us have got that call to mm. love one another. And I think that if we can learn to love people with the same mercy and grace and compassion that Jesus has loved us, and we've all experienced that, then I don't think we're going to go far wrong. I love it. I love it. Well, we were talking, thank you, Kay, so much. Um, Lizzie and I just love the way that you and Chris use your pastoral gifts, your shepherding gifts for your connect group and for us at times as well. Um, I ended up on Monday Night Prayers in a prophecy group with Chris and 
um, he shared a, a word that he had had and then a couple of days later sent a poem that he felt inspired to write that came out of what it is that he felt God had said to him for me and then so I was encouraged but then he shared it more widely other people have been encouraged and I just love the way that the, the ministry of the spirit connects together it's not yeah. I'm not just a pastor but I'm able to use the prophetic in being a pastor exactly. I'm able to use the being a pastor to do evangelism yeah. I'm able to see what God might want to do in, in the apostolic realm by loving people yeah. and so we're not confined to just one now we may yep. feel stronger and, and safer in one and that's what we want to pray for uh, right now, for those who are feeling like, yes, this is who I am. We want to encourage you, release you, affirm you. Uh, and we want to ask Kay then to pray for us. And if you'd like to, we did this a couple of weeks ago uh, for the apostles. Simon asked if you're an apostle, maybe put a little emoji with your hand up or identify yourself in the chat. If you want to do that, great. If you don't, that's fine too. But we would love to hear back from you if that is you so that we can encourage the pastors uh, the shepherds within our community so Kay is going to pray we're going to sing uh, a little bit of worship and just allow the holy spirit to come and touch us as i was mentioning before we do that just one final thing from me um the lord brought back to me something that happened to me um many many years ago when somebody prophetically ha spoke something over me and I, I was a teenager, I was an awkward teenager, and they felt like the Lord asking them to give me a hug. Now, Kay, <laughs> this must have been one of the most awkward prophetic ministry times ever, because <laughs> this person was giving me a, a long hug, and I was just standing there going, this is so awkward, this is horrendous. And the Lord brought it back to me this week, partly because of Chris's prophetic word from Monday night. And as we were praying uh, before the service, I felt like the Lord say, it's not just for me, but it's for some of us uh, watching online as well, that perhaps we're not willing to let the Father embrace us yeah. and receive the love that he has for us because we just feel a bit awkward mm. and it's a bit uncomfortable and we'd yeah. rather just get on with everything else. And I think the Lord wants to use this time of worship we're about to have, this time of prayer that Kay's going to begin us off in to love on us, yeah. to refill us with his love, his affirmation of us as father, as the one who sent his son so that we could be forgiven through his death and resurrection, the one whose spirit is alive and at work in us. Mm. So, okay, if you would pray and then yeah. we worship, I encourage you to allow the father to love on you as you receive yeah. the Holy Spirit. Amazing. Come on, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Yeah, I just want to respond to what Gareth has just said. And maybe as you've been listening here this morning, actually what resonates for you is not being a shepherd, but needing a shepherd. Maybe what's resonated with you is the fact that you need somebody to walk alongside, to care for you, to love you. So Father God, I just pray for, for each person feeling like that this morning, that, that they would not be lonely. Nobody in this church should be lonely. Nobody in this church should feel that they don't have somebody to reach out to. And I pray, Father God, that you would just meet those people right now, yes. that you would wrap your arms around them and love them, that they would know that they are not alone, that they would know that you see them, that you run after that one sheep, that you leave everybody else behind because you love that one person so just wait now just feel the love of God upon you you are not alone and to those of you this morning maybe something of what we've said has just resonated with you and you're like yep yeah, I'm a shepherd that's what God has called me to be I just want to say rise up mm, come on. have courage Step into the calling that God has given you. Yeah. Don't be disappointed, but be excited for all that God has called you to be. I think there's a word for, for some of the men watching this morning. We need pastoral men of God to reach out to men who are hurting. And I just pray 
that if you are a man and you know somebody, you've got a friend, you've got somebody in your sphere of influence that just needs a word of encouragement, that you would have the courage to step out, to be that person, to be Jesus to that person, to be the person that makes a difference to them. I want to pray too for some of those people who are maybe in their more mature years, who maybe think that their time of calling is, is fading. And I want to say to you, no, this church needs to be loved. This church needs heavenly parents, heavenly grandparents. And so for those of us that are older in years, don't fade away and settle back, but step into what God is calling you to be. You have a call. There are people that need your love, your word of encouragement, your recognition. Step into what God is calling you to be. And I think too this morning there might be people who who've maybe had their fingers burnt or maybe their hearts broken. And maybe that's because you've not been shepherded well. Or maybe that's because you've tried this and it's not worked out well. And I want to say to you this morning that God says this is a fresh season, a new season for you. He will be with you. Step out with him. He will give you everything that you need. He equips those that he calls and he will equip you for what he is calling you into. So shepherds, pastors, rise up, step into the calling and embrace all that God has for you. Yeah. Come on. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.